you know, in a, in a, in a recent speech, uh, we made it clear that there is no path to the end of poverty uh, without improving the productivity of agriculture and finding a way that as climate change reduces the amount of arable land that we can feed everyone. Now, Dave, uh, David is, um, it, it was, has been one of my heroes. You know, when I was at Dartmouth, uh, my board member said, if there's one person in the world that we could introduce you to, who would it be? And I said, David Chang. Uh, he's a Korean American like me. He was a champion golfer at the age of 10. Uh, and he is now one of the most famous, respected chefs in the entire world. And his dedication uh, to perfection uh, was something that I knew about. But what I learned after we got to know each other was that, that, that David and all of the other great chefs in the world don't just think about making delicious food, but think about making delicious food that can feed the entire world. And he knew so much about growing methods, and he knew so much about uh, so many aspects of feeding people that I suggested to him that we have this conversation. I don't think he knew what he was getting into, <laughs> but, but uh, I, 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 we're thrilled to have him here. And I, I think that enlisting the great chefs of the world in thinking about how to feed the world uh, is something that we're, we're going to commit to going forward. And uh, we're thrilled to know that uh, there are many chefs who are committed to the same task. So first of all, Dave, you have talked about redefining edibility. What the heck does that mean? I think we just need to take a look at what we find to taste good. And I think a lot of people throw away food. As uh, Jorgen mentioned, we throw away 1.3 billion tons of food a year. That's a third of the food that is produced, which is just probably the easiest way to reducing hunger uh, in the world is being more resourceful, much more frugal about it. And as a, uh, I just think that that's the issue at hand. And, and uh, as a chef, we try to make delicious food out of things that are not normally delicious, using techniques like fermentations, which I'm very passionate about. Other people are looking at insects and finding ways to find protein and things you would never look at before uh, and making that accessible to everybody and realizing that you know, food can be delicious in many ways that you wouldn't, might, might not normally think. So uh, it, it, when you guys think about this number, 800 million people that go hungry every day, how would you start? I mean, you, I've, you've talked to me about uh, growing methods. We've got to change growing methods. We've got to change the way uh, we handle food. We have to change food subsidies, make it more expensive for people who can pay. So what would be a plan that, that, uh, that, that uh, you guys could, could uh, help us launch? I think that the first and foremost that as a chef can do is increase knowledge and awareness um, and have some type of programs out there that make people know that food literally uh, is planted, some lives are taken, yeah. and then there's a very rich process that goes involved in. The more you're able to respect that, I think the less waste you're gonna be able to create. Hmm. Is, there, is there a difference though between delicious food and, and having more sustainable uh, 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 systems that are uh, adapted to local conditions? As someone that has learned about cooking and working with farmers, you realize that sustainable, growing things the right way is no, it's, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. It's the, sort of the same thing. Growing things the right way and making delicious food is sort of the one and the same to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, uh, if you were to tell us, I, I know you're, you have direct relationships with a lot of the farms, the growers and the producers. What are they doing differently, especially the ones who are supplying food to you? What are the kinds of things that then potentially could be scaled in uh, other parts of the world? Um, you know, when you first start co cooking, you, 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 you know that you need to work with the right farmers, that uh, you, you hear that they're doing it the right way, whatever that may be. And then as you build that relationship, you see that it's like anything else that's great. They care about it so much more. And at the end of the day, you have to care about food. And the more you care about it, the more delicious it is. And when you see farmers, whether it's someone that's raising uh, free range pigs, um, they're giving them the option, not the option, but they're raising a healthier pig. Do which they taste better? It also? tastes better. A happier, <laughs> happier animal tastes more okay. delicious, too. Yeah. And, and as a cook, you want to bring that out to the guest that's eating it as well. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, to go back, uh, the, the Momofuku restaurants, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, everyone on my team knows is that uh, when we go to New York, and we go there a lot, we've got to make a stop at one of your restaurants, right? So Momofuku means lucky peach in Japan, but it's also the first name of Momofuku Ando, the Taiwanese-Japanese uh, 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 sort of 
Yeah, revolutionary who invented uh, instant ramen. Correct. Right? So what were you thinking? I mean, you know, he, he did that because he wanted to feed the world. I mean, that was specifically his, uh, his, his goal. Right, and it was also a war-torn Japan because he was an expatriate to, uh, to Japan after, after the World War II. And I think that uh, that was really interesting to me is to, you know, as a sh people, I, I make food for very few people. Let's be honest here. Very, very few people comparatively to the people that need to eat well. <clears throat> and the more I'm in this business, the more I want to feed everybody. And that's really the goal is our goal is to make great food. And you don't want to just make it for a few select people because the people that need to really eat well in this world are the, they, they have the worst access to it. And that just doesn't sit right with me. That's great. Well, so... Uh, if you, um, uh, if you uh, uh, look at what Momofuku Andu, Andu did, tell me, what was your path there? All right? So you, you were a champion golfer. You went to, to, to great school, Trinity College. Uh, you were thinking about doing a lot of things. You were a religion major. Right? Now, I know your dad uh, owned a lot of restaurants, and your mom's a great cook. But how do you make that decision? Because I tell you, you know, when I heard that you had become a chef, I thought, oh my goodness, Korean American parents, you know, son becomes a chef, they must have gone crazy. How did you make that choice? And tell me about your evolution. Well, my dad was in the restaurant business. It was, he basically worked his entire life to ensure that I would never work in the restaurant industry because <laughs> yeah. it is such a hard, hard job to have. And that's why I love everybody so dearly that works in this industry, whether it's the farmers, the purveyors, or the people actually making your food. It really is a labor of love, and it's something that I'm really dedicated to improving upon from every facet. But in terms of how I got there <clears throat> and opening up Momofugu, I... I worked in fancy restaurants trying to learn the best techniques because you want to learn how to make great food. And that necessarily wasn't the way I grew up eating. Uh, having a dad, we would eat a lot of noodles. We would eat a variety of things. Growing up in a Korean household, I didn't know that good food, it, it, at least in America, seemed to only be in fine dining establishments. And then having the really the luxury and the opportunity of living abroad, traveling abroad, all over the world, you realize that great food is amazing at all price points, and some of the best eating in the world is uh, on the lower end. Uh, and that's when I was like, wait, great food should be available for everybody. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, using Momofu Ando as an example, is that, that watching everyone eat well, that's an that's a experience that hopefully I, I want everyone to have. It is that delicious moment in their mind where like, I, you're not thinking about anything else. And the reality is many people haven't had that experience. And that's something that is really universal, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, Dave, we at one point talked about food subsidies. And you told me something that um, shocked me at the time. You said food should be more expensive. And then we looked into this, and we found that food subsidies uh, in the world are a huge expense. And that uh, in, in, the likelihood is that it benefits the rich more than it benefits the poor. It's the, it's the same thing that we found with fuel subsidies, that the rich get more of the benefit. So tell me about that. What can we do about fuel, food subsidies and, uh, and their existence in the world? I think we should subsidize the things that are actually good for you to eat. Um, I, again, I, I mentioned that some of the most nutritious, most uh, needed things to eat in your diet are not available to people in food deserts and are on the poverty level. So uh, if we can make that more available, I think that's the first step to, to alleviating that problem. And tell me about some of the other, uh, there's their very, you know, the thing that's been great for me to find out is that the great chefs of the world uh, somehow come together. You're, you're very good friends. And so uh, the, uh, the number one restaurant in the world, Noma, Rene Redzipi, is a good friend of yours. And uh, I've you know, seen uh, uh, photos of him literally walking around Copenhagen, picking like uh, grasses and things off the, uh, uh, off the fields. Uh, tell me about some of these chefs. And, and what, you know, they're, they're making great food. They're making money. They're becoming famous. But it seems like there's now a growing movement, just like you, in, in wanting to help feed the entire world. You know, as a, all of these chefs, uh, they realize that we're in this together and that a lot of the shared problems that we're going through are the experiences uh, that are really a global problem. And feeding other people is something that we do. We are in the hospitality business. And sometimes I have to remind myself that that's why I'm in this business is to make other people happy. And it doesn't have to be located just within our restaurants. And you brought up Rene Redzepi, who's really helped revolutionize the global food movement. And one of the things that he's been instrumental in is showing that food doesn't have to be 
what you think it is. And again, he's really been a proponent of redefining edibility. You could be stepping on the food right now. Hmm. And that's just challenging the status quo of, of what food can be and utilizing his years of knowledge and the teamwork involved to making that delicious. In fact, it has been rated like the number one restaurant in the world. So it just goes to show you that if you're determined to make it delicious, it can't happen. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is going to be the challenge for us? I mean, we, how can we do this? How can we work together with the great chefs of the world uh, to begin a very different kind of conversation about how to feed the world? Because, you know, it, it's, it's a... Uh, the, 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 the systems in place now, I think no one's happy with, right? You know, we, we uh, uh, sometimes subsidize uh, farmers in wealthy countries and take those and, you know, drop them in other places and it can, you know, it can really hurt local markets and the quality of the food's not that great. Uh, what, what would it look like? And, and I, I'm ready to make a commitment Dave, to you guys right now and to bring these groups together so that we can start this new conversation. What, what would it look like? Well, as a chef, I'm not the person that's on the front lines. Uh, in fact, I'm barely the person that's making the food these days anymore. It's, and, and, and it's using that principle in the sense that uh, we are good at telling narratives, whether it's a diner eating at our restaurants or a narrative of somebody we were working with and we can shed light upon. And the spotlight really should be upon the people that are in the trenches. Uh, we have a couple here today. Uh, Cheetah Guevara, yeah, great uh, David Hertz, who you'll hear their stories uh, momentarily. And what they're doing is really what should be emulated and copied uh, about uh, finding ways to feed people, yeah. feed people well. All right. We, we, we make the promise. We will, we will uh, bring that coalition together. We hope to host you here. We'll co come to your meetings. And this is the right conversation. So, you know, given that, I mean, I, the reason I think I love your food so much is because I think we grew up... Our fathers grew up about 20 miles apart in Korea. They have the same accents. I think we share taste buds in some real way. But what are your challenges in making delicious food? I mean, you've, you've been credited with uh, innovation after innovation. Uh, what's, what's the hardest thing now? What's the next thing? You know, Brussels sprouts, buns, you know, the, the pork, all these great things that you've done. How are you thinking now in terms of changing uh, uh, the, the, the idea of what is great food again? Um, for me right now, it's about growth and scalability. And I feel like change can only happen through having a voice that can um, really uh, change how people grow food. People are marketed to food, and we want to be part of that conversation. So uh, I, I know how to feed people, uh, whether it be 1,000 people a day or whatever number we feed a day. But again, that's not challenging enough to me anymore. Really? Yeah. What's the, what's the, what's the vision? What, what, what's it going to be? Um, you know, privately, for me, it's I want my cooks to get paid better. Yeah. And I know that if we can do that and still be profitable, um, we're going to be a good custodian to our environment. We're going to be good neighbors. We're going to be great supporters of our farmers. And just focus on local, um, being, being great at that. And then, again, supporting the people uh, on a much larger scale that can, that can do it much better than ever we can. Will we see Momofuku golden arches everywhere in the world at some day? You know what? <laughs> probably 10 years ago, I would have laughed at that and probably said no. But if we can do it right and make it better than what's available out yeah, there, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say no because something has to improve. Yeah. And whether we're it or somebody else, that's what we have to support. That's great. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to make this happen. We're going we're gonna, to uh, take this forward. And uh, Dave, what else do you want to uh, tell us about? I mean, this business is so difficult, right? I mean, the restaurant business is notoriously so, so difficult. And uh, what, can we, uh, what, what can we do uh, here at a place like the World Bank Group? If the restaurant business is difficult in New York City, if the restaurant business is difficult in Washington, D.C., you can imagine all the challenges of getting food to people in, in some of the really, really poor places uh, uh, that we work. So uh, uh, could you imagine uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of effort that we took on together in a developing country somewhere to try to really rethink uh, food from the ground up? Absolutely. I mean, two things that come to mind are, in de especially developing countries, is we need to have some type of program or mentorship program to teaching people how to cook and to cook. arming them with knowledge. It's a low-tech solution that is very powerful. Uh, if they know how to store food properly and 
and uh, use ways to preserve it better, uh, that's, that's extraordinarily, uh, you know, that's going to work without a doubt. We just need to be focused on education. And uh, second thing, in my opinion, is uh, improving logistics. I think a lot of developing countries don't have the electricity or the transportation needs to uh, procuring fresh food or uh, using electricity for refrigeration. And these are things that obviously people need. Great.